Good morning, friends. Uh, welcome to Brick Lane Community Church. Let me ask you whether you are sitting here in this building with us or whether you're watching online. Let me ask you to consider the question of whether you are prepared today to meet God. That sounds pretty lofty and maybe a little bit scary, but it seems that it's worth reminding ourselves that that is our business today. Today, as we gather, our aim is to meet God. It may look just like religious rituals, but don't be fooled. We will speak and hear words of different kinds today. We will, we will listen to, we will uh, perhaps sing and make music today. We will listen to a sermon. We will respond to it in some way. But our aim is that right in the center of that, we should meet with God. We should, by the Spirit's power, see something of the heights of God's glory and the depths of his grace on behalf of us. That's our aim for today. Uh, we are beginning today in a way that perhaps is a little bit unusual, <laughs> but very glad that we, if we're ready to meet God, that we can be led into God's presence by a call to worship that comes from our first grade Sunday school class. So, if you would, let me ask you to remain seated and hear the word of the Lord. Seated while these folks go and find their seats for us, our aim is today to celebrate before the God who is king over all the earth, who sits on his holy throne, the God of all. Can we do that as we sing? You'll recognize the song. Let's sing together.
It is a great and joyous thing to be able to worship the Lord of heaven and earth, the one who is exalted far above all gods. Great and joyous, if only it were safe. But of course, I know my weakness, and I suspect you know yours, and God, the holy judge, of heaven and earth knows better than we do. Remember these great and awesome words that come from Hebrews chapter 4, the word of the Lord. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. God's word. God knows. Could I ask you to take a moment in silence to acknowledge your sin before the God who knows and turn away from it. Amen. Friends, if you are aware of your own sin, then how great is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, who knows better than you do your sin, has acted 
to take away the sin of the world. Is that not good news? <laughs> Remember Paul's proclamation of it in Colossians chapter 2. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, you, God made alive together with Christ, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This record of debt he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Brothers and sisters, what we could not do, God has done in Christ. Christ has lived the life that you should have lived and died the death that you should have died and been raised to life so that a new kind of life is available for us. Thanks be to God, in the name of Jesus, if you have confessed your sins, if you are in Christ, your sins are forgiven. Could I ask then that we join together to celebrate this great gospel message? Take up your hymnal, if you would, and turn with me to page 846. 846. You know that Christians have celebrated this gospel for many long generations. And we want to join with them today. So you might think, uh, do you have in mind today Christians that you know or have heard of in Ukraine or in the Czech Republic or in Bangladesh or in Nigeria or perhaps somewhere closer to home? Let's join with them, with the people of God everywhere to celebrate the threefold name that is our salvation. Will you stand with me, please? The Nicene Creed. Christians, what do you believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And he shall come again with glory, to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Let's sing hymn number 500.
Let's be seated. Friends, if you have been reminded of the good news of the gospel, as we have encountered it already this morning, for all those who hide themselves in Christ, then maybe we're ready to remind ourselves also of what Christ calls us to be when we are hidden there. Here's our third and fourth grade Sunday school class to remind us of what we're called to be. The word of the Lord. Amen. Friends, once again, remain seated and let's sing Rock of Ages. love hearing children speak the word of God. <laughs> uh, could I ask that we join them in speaking the word of God to one another? Take your bulletin in your hand, if you would, and turn with me to page five there, page five, and let's stand together. Most of the material in this responsive reading we have already encountered in this service. It comes from Colossians chapter 2 and 3, most of it except the first line, which we've already sung. Our aim is to speak it now together, boldly, in the presence of God, by the Spirit of God. We should be the people of God. Let's read the word of God together. We begin all together. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. From Colossians chapter 2. In Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Filled in him who is the head. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. <coughs> circumcised by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Buried with him. Raised with him. 
and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, those who were dead, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Those who were dead, God made alive by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. By canceling our debt, nailing it to the cross. Filled in him, circumcised by his circumcision, let me hide myself in thee. Buried with him, raised with him, let me hide myself in thee. You who were dead, God made alive with him. Let me hide myself in thee. And from Colossians 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. You have been raised with Christ. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Let me hide myself in thee. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Put on compassionate hearts, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you almost also must forgive. Forgive each other. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Above all, put on love. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. Let the peace of Christ rule. Let the peace of Christ rule and be thankful. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Let the word of Christ dwell richly, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Let me hide myself in thee. And whatever you do, in word or deed, whatever you do, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let me hide myself in thee. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Amen. Hymn number 644.
And will you join me, please, in prayer? Our great Father, from all that dwell below the skies, let the Creator's praise arise. Oh God, may it be so, may, may, may it be so, for it is certainly true that thou, O oh Lord, art high above all the heavens. Thou art exalted far above all gods. These great words from Scripture, from our songs, these are great Old Testament words. How much more, Holy Father, do we know the, the greatness of your exaltation after we have seen the greatness of what you've done for us in your Son and by the Spirit? For now, oh my, now more clearly than ever, we have seen the rock of ages cleft for me. And you have hidden our lives in Christ. So that by the Spirit's power, O oh Lord, we pray, let the mind of Christ rule in us, live in us today, this day, every day. By the power of the resurrection of Christ, let the word of God dwell richly in us. Won't you do that even today, holy God? By virtue of our being hidden in Christ, will you let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts? Will you let the love of Christ fill us? Will you let the beauty of Christ rest upon us? How are we to reflect the beauty of the Son of God? How, oh God, except that you should place us deep in him. Our lives are hidden in Christ. And so, very gratefully, Lord our God, we hide ourselves in you. As we think about our individual lives and about our life as a congregation, we hide ourselves in you, O oh Lord. As we think of Anna May and her family as she is in rehab at Zerby Sisters, we hide ourselves in you and give her to you. As we think about Rita's three-year-old great-nephew, Wyatt, who will have open-heart surgery tomorrow. Oh God, we hide ourselves in you as we give this child into your hands. Or as we think of Kirk's father, Carl, with surgery scheduled for next month, the waiting, the surgery itself. Oh Lord, we hide ourselves in you and commit them into your hands. We remember others. We think of Arlie and of Doris and of Deb and of Bruce and of how many others where there's good reports or not such good reports. O oh Lord, we hide ourselves in you. Where else can we hide as we deal with the ups and downs of our experience here on this earth? On this earth? As we think together about joys and sorrows, about new children through weddings, or new grandchildren born, or new graduates that are around us, or as we think again about funerals or about whatever our experience is of suffering or conflict, O oh Lord, we hide ourselves in you. Where else can we be safe? 
We as a congregation do that as we think repeatedly about the new pastoral leadership that we look forward to. We pray for a special measure of your blessing on the committee of elders and others who are seeking your will for us there. Go ahead of us, O Lord. We hide ourselves in you. Again, as we think about the work that we do, even the work that we will celebrate today at our service this afternoon and picnic and so forth, then how much more the larger work, the global work that goes on around the globe. The summer missions programs that we'll be a part of in the next few months. Just the, the local day-to-day -day faithfulness that we are called to and that we find so difficult sometimes. Oh Lord, we hide ourselves in you. Let your spirit be made fully, richly alive in us. Even this day, even this day, instructed, we pray by the word of God as Pastor Steve comes to preach to us here in a few minutes. Go ahead of us so that what we do and what we are can look like the Son of God who gave himself for us, the one who is king of all the earth. Let the world know that God reigns over the nations, that God sits on his holy throne, and that the rock of ages is our rock, the rock of life. We give you thanks, O Lord our God, in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen and amen. Friends, will you stand with me one more time as we sing once again?
Just before we read part of our passage today from 1 Kings chapter 19, a brief introduction about two things that revolve around lunchtimes. The first is a lunchtime sandwich, and the second is a lunchtime conversation. The lunchtime sandwich. How often have you been at a deli? You ordered a sub, let's say. Your eyes got a little too big for your stomach. It comes out. They have to have two guys carry it. It's so long. And you look at it and you say, I think I'll cut that in half and take a box on the second half. That's exactly what happened to me this week looking at this chapter. I have looked forward for a long time to come to this chapter. I was taken aback by how deep it is. I knew it would be that. Taken aback by how hard it is. I did not quite expect it to be that. And very late in the game, decided to only speak the first half of this sermon. That changes the nature of it a little bit. So I appreciate your patience with me on that. Now, a lunchtime conversation. For the last few years, one of the great privileges I've had is to speak two or three years in a row at, at a conference of pastors at uh, Harvey Cedars, New Jersey. Some of you may be familiar with that Bible conference. Pastors and their wives come. And over breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you sit at a table with whoever you want to sit with, maybe about eight people or so, and you talk and listen to each other's stories. Vernon and I find it so moving and interesting and helpful and humbling to hear the uphill climb that so many of these good brothers and their wives have out in the vineyard of the Lord trying to reap in his garden and do the right thing. The, the weight of pressures, particularly cumulative pressures, are there. This particular uh, time we went, which was earlier in May, uh, they announced a special prayer meeting for anybody who wanted to do so. It had not been planned before. So after breakfast, but before the first service, anyone who had children, for instance, who not only are drifting away, but who have children who are actually estranged from you as parents and have cut off all communications, would you like to pray? I didn't sit and count, but I would say there were at least 40 people in that room holding hands in a circle, praying appropriately, not mentioning any name that would divulge anybody's uh, identity, but speaking to God from what you could tell was the depths of their souls about the agony of children they cannot, whose voices they cannot hear, of grandchildren they're not allowed to see. This is so very deep. The discouragement of Christian people, particularly in this case a Christian prophet, of anyone trying to live his or her life to serve God that comes is what this first half of this chapter is all about. Reading now then from 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1 through part of verse 3. Now Ahab took Jezebel. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Chapter 18 of 1 Kings, just before this passage, is admitted by all to be one of the most dramatic in the entire Old Testament. It's the great story on top of Mount Carmel in Israel where the prophets of Baal and the one prophet of Jehovah, Elijah, had a contest to see who the real God is. And the prophets of Baal set up their altar, put wood and an animal on it, and prayed all day for Baal to send fire from heaven. They eventually danced in such a frenzy they cut themselves pleading, and yet nothing but silence greeted them. Then Elijah slowly, carefully, deliberately, rebuilt stone by stone the fallen altar of Jehovah on that mountain. He lay out the animal and he asked that water drench the sacrifice 
and he dug a trench around, and the water filled the trench so it would be so wet that no human could possibly wet it. And then rather than dance around, moan and groan, gyrate and cut himself, he looked heavenward and prayed, Lord God, I ask you that you please would let these people know that I am your prophet, that you have sent me, and that you are turning their hearts back to you. And immediately from the sky came such a fire as probably had never been seen because although twice before in the Bible, fire had been sent by God from heaven on an altar to show his pleasure and his presence, this time it says that the fire burned not only the sacrifice, not only the wood, but the stones themselves, the dirt that it was built on, and all the water was licked up. And afterwards then, Elijah said, in essence, we must now do what God has told us to do in the book of the law. That is, if anybody in his country of Israel worships false gods or pushes others to worship false gods, they must be killed. And so 400 prophets of Baal were dragged to the bottom of this magnificent mountain and slaughtered because God had commanded it to be so. Now King Ahab was watching the entire time. It was him and his wife who had dragged the entire nation of Israel away from the worship of the true God to the worship of this wretched false God with his immoral and inaccurate teachings and the disgusting things that were done in the worship of Baal and his consort Asherah, both of them idols, non-gods, demonic powers. And so what happened was after this, Ahab, who was amazed at this, was told by Elijah, now there's been a famine for three and a half years, but now Jehovah is going to send rain. Hit your chariot and go home. You better hurry, otherwise you're gonna bog down in the torrent and in the mire. And so we read that Ahab drove his chariot the 17 miles to his summer palace of Jezreel where his wife Jezebel awaited. And we read, read that Elijah was given strength by the Holy Spirit of God to run in front of him as if to show, King, although you have led this nation astray, Jehovah has just showed himself strong. I am with you. I will serve you. I will be with you. And together we can reform this country. And so they pull up to the palace at Jezreel. Elijah goes his own way. And Ahab goes into the house. Waiting for him in the house is Jezebel, whose name is famous even today, so many centuries later, even from people who have never opened the Bible a single page. She was the one from a foreign nation of Phoenicia, who first introduced the worship of Baal to her husband and through her husband to the entire nation, the most wicked woman that has probably ever come across Israel. Now, it is clearly nighttime if we read the entire narratives. The servants unhitch the chariot and Ahab goes into the palace and there in the bedroom he speaks and there is a dead earnest conversation between husband and wife. Meanwhile, Elijah, who has gone his way, wonders, what will happen? This wife, who has so much been the power behind the throne and has dragged her husband in her evil ways, will he be able to stand up to her as a king, or will she run him over like she's done in the past? Will the nation turn around, or will it continue going off the cliff? We read in verse 1 that Ahab told Jezebel, everything that Elijah had done. What a way to express it. Yes, uh, she was told the scene on the mountain, who stood where, the two altars, the fact that the prophets of Baal, 400 of them went first, what happened when Elijah then called upon God. But the passage focuses not on just the event itself, but the passage says he told his wife everything that Elijah had done, and she hated this man hugely. He told her about the water that was soaking, that was licked up, the prayer, the fire, and dare Ahab say it? Ahab said, and, and I imagine he swallowed this point, honey, your 400 prophets of Baal, every one of them is dead as we sit here on the side of the bed. How did Jezebel react? I imagine as she listens, she's absolute stone. And then as the reality of what just happened sinks into her, she becomes livid. 
Almost half of her whole religious staff is gone. The prophets of Asherah are still living. And what's interesting is she is told about the miracle of a God in heaven who sends fire down in a spectacular way to prove beyond question that he is the real God. This means nothing to her. She hears the rain outside the window in a torrent that they have longed for for three and a half years of famine. It means nothing. She hears about Elijah's 17-mile run ahead of the horses of the chariots of Ahab. Yahweh obviously giving him supernatural power. This means nothing to her. The only thing she hears are the words killed and the words sword. And this makes her in a rage. The only thing she can think is, I have been crossed. My will has been violated. My world of comfort, my world of delights has been shattered. And so she swears by her gods. By the way, the gods that had not been able to produce rain for three and a half years nor fire from heaven. She swears by her gods, I will kill this so-and-so. And thus we see in her the nature of sin in a way more powerful than if you just read it in a didactic passage of the Bible. How sin blinds us, enslaves us. Sin leads us to insanity against all thinking that would be right and that would be helpful and eventually drags us into hell. Her actions are a picture of what, uh, of what the Apostle John said hundreds of years later in John 3.19. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, meaning Jesus, but men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. This is what is going on in the pinnacle of power in Israel that night. And so she summons her servant, I would imagine immediately, to send a message to Elijah. Find him and let him know, you are a dead man and the deed will be done within 24 hours. Now, most scholars who write about this passage at this point, argue that it was clear she did not intend to kill Elijah. They argue this because they say if she was going to kill him, she wouldn't warn him. She'd just have somebody sneak up on him in the middle of the night and slit his throat. That's possibly true. But it seems to me a little more probable that the following is true. Um, Ahab had never been able to control her, so she is now going to tell Elijah, I am coming for you because she wants to make his last 24 hours hellish with fear before they actually catch up with him, which she expects to do. She wants to dangle him over the pit before she drops him. In any case, <clears throat> what did Elijah do when all this happened? We read that Elijah, verse 3, was afraid and he ran for his life. And what happened next is told in 1 Kings 19, verses 3 through the beginning of verse 5. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I have enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down until under the tree and fell asleep. We read that Elijah flees and he arrives in Judah. Judah, as you may remember, is the country directly to the south of Israel. Originally, it was all one country, but they split and broke into Jerusalem is down in Judah. And so, because he has now crossed the border into another country, he is safe. But the text makes clear that he doesn't stop there. He keeps going until he arrives in Beersheba in Judah. Beersheba is in the southernmost part of the country, very near the border. Why does Elijah need to go so far? And here we read that he leaves his servant 
and goes on. Why does he leave his servant? The Bible doesn't say. I can imagine at least two reasons that are good possibilities. One is this. It seems, and many people think so, that Elijah feels a great need to be alone. He craves solitude. He is broken in body. He's broken in spirit. Perhaps you can relate when you're facing terrible grief, terribly upset. Sometimes the comfort of people is useless to you. You just need to be by yourself. But there's a second reason that many suggest, and I would tend to agree with this too, that's a bigger reason why he left his servant. And the reason is because Elijah has had it. He doesn't need a servant anymore. He has resigned as a prophet. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. He needs no servant because he has no ministry. He's not looking back. He is never going to return. And we read that he takes a day's journey into the desert, probably beyond the border of Judah to the south, carrying no food, no water with him. You get the idea of what he's intending to do and what he thinks the end will be. First, we read in the text that he comes a day's journey and he sits down. He sits down under a broom tree. A broom tree, I'm told by people who study these matters, is, is found in those desert areas, only in the gullies where periodically water might flow. It can go to about 10 feet tall and it's known to be a wide spreading tree and its leaves do provide a good amount of shade compared to any other vegetation out there. And he prays to God and he says, God, I am no better than my ancestors. It's hard to know exactly what he means by that, but at least one thing, uh, the suggestion I've heard that might be, might be the way to go is that he's saying, Lord, my ancestors are all in the grave. They're all dead. They're all useless to you. And I might as well be dead and in the grave because I am done and useless. I've had enough, he said. This courageous prophet, this great, gallant champion at the top of Mount Carmel, who has the respect of everybody who reads about him even today, now he prays to God and he says, God, take my life. He prayed, we read, that he might die. I don't know if anybody in this room has ever prayed that. I imagine there might be a few. When you do that, you're at the absolute end of your rope and praying in desperation. It's the kind of prayer that you, if you're thinking rationally, how could you pray? But it's coming from the depths of a soul that is crying. He's asking for relief in a final way from suffering. He's asking to be relieved from work and from responsibility. This is why I suspect he went into the desert without food and water. He is sinking. He is helpless. He's absolutely hopeless. And then the Bible says, having sat down, having prayed, then he laid down. My guess is he lays down, curls up, who knows, maybe even in a fetal position. Picture the man. He's exhausted bodily. I mean, he, no, no way he could help but be exhausted. Just yesterday, think of what he had done. Picked up 12 massive stones after climbing that huge mountain and arranged them together. And then taking all that wood and doing whatever it took to get enough wood for the fire and put it on there. And then butchering a bull. I have watched Homer Shorts, one of our former members, a butcher, a pig. I've seen Rich Hornberger go at it with him. And it is no task of, uh, of lightness. It takes a lot of work and a lot of energy and it's time consuming. And then he oversees the killing of 400 prophets, very possibly killing many of them himself. And then he runs at night 17 miles to Jezreel and in the middle of the night, or at latest, early the next morning, with hardly any sleep, he gets this message, and he flees, and he goes a good deal away. Beersheba is over 100 miles from Jezreel. And now, that's as the crow flies, and of course you can't grow as a crow flies in, in a circuitous mountainous country like that. And so here he is, now he arrives at Beersheba, and then he goes a day into the desert. No wonder he falls asleep. Now here is where studying this passage to me became absolutely shocking. I had never studied this passage at all, though I had read it many times, perhaps like some of you, 
And maybe if you have studied this passage, you've come across what I'm going to say now. And it is the way that commentators, that is scholars writing commentaries about this book, and I'm very much including evangelical, Bible-believing Christian scholars, the way that they see and view Elijah here is shocking. They are critical about him to the point of cruelty. Um, uh, They are combining what Elijah does under the tree here with later what he will do when he goes far into the desert and climbs Mount Horeb to meet with God. And they say, taking those two things together, well, here's what Elijah is going to say in the next part of the the chapter that we won't get to today. He's going to tell God, God, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty, but the Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've broken down your altars. They put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. What do you read about Elijah in that? Here's what a number of people say. This list particularly was compiled by Ralph Davis, and uh, I'm just picking out little samples. Quote, Elijah cracked up here. Quote, he was suffering from manic depression and excessive self-pity. Quote, when God needed him most, The divinely trained prophet was to prove a notable failure. Here he was in the desert wasteland, the very symbol of a wasted life. Another person put, we see him in need of God's rebuke. It makes you almost want to weep to see that, and I really did read just a sampling. How are we supposed to see Elijah in this story, and what does that teach us as we do? Well, it seems to me that there are several angles that we can see Elijah in this story from, and one is from what the text implies about what was in his heart and soul. Our passage, you may remember from verse 3, told why Elijah had fled. It reads in the New International, and the ESV says the same thing, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Most versions agree with translating it that way. Elijah was afraid, and thus he ran. But there is another possible reading that other manuscripts have, and several of the great translations have this, including the famous King James Version, and it reads like this. And when Elijah saw, not when Elijah was afraid, when Elijah saw, he arose and went for his life. And the great Old Testament scholar Kyle translates it this way. And when Elijah saw how it was, he ran. The idea is this behind that translation that Elijah had hoped that Ahab would be changed from what he saw on the mountain and that when he talked to Jezebel, Jezebel would at the very least back down or that Ahab would be stronger than she. But now it is clear to Elijah that Jezebel is still very much with her hands on the steering wheel of the nation, that Ahab is her puppy dog on a leash and that the entire nation is going to double down in Baal worship. And so... Elijah's conclusion is this, this great contest that was the pinnacle of his life where Jehovah was finally, after three and a half years of punishing famine for their Baal worship, going to show the people what the true grace of God expressed through rain is like and that it will turn their hearts and now they will follow him. And Elijah realizes it has all crumbled like a house of cards. He says, I did my best shot. Baal is going to stay ahead of the country, and Israel will not change. And therefore, these passages read, when Elijah saw that this was the case, he ran for his life. I I would say several things lead one. And again, Davis is probably the best person I've seen to argue this. Here's why you think that that's the way to read it, rather than Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. The, The first is this. When he runs away from Jezebel... As soon as he crosses the border into Judah, he is safe. But he goes further than that. He goes all the way to the south of Judah to Beersheba, the southernmost city. As I say, about 100 more, 100, uh, more than 100 miles away from where Jezebel is. And then he keeps going into the desert. Something more than just hiding from her seems to be going on. A second reason to think why Elijah did not run because of fear of Jezebel is this. The word in the Hebrew language, and he was afraid, or the word, and he saw 
look very, very similar. It is easy to mistake them. So whenever you have two different readings, say from two different manuscripts, the big question is this, which one was the original and which one was changed by someone who thought they could improve upon the text? It doesn't happen in a great many places, but it happens in some places. And the idea is this, and, and here, this may prove boring to some of you, it's only a minute or two, but for others of you, it may be helpful. Whenever there are two different texts of the Bible, I'm talking about the manuscripts that disagree with one another, one of the ways that, that scholars decide which was the original is that the harder of the two readings, the reading that seems most difficult, the reading that is most puzzling and makes you scratch your head, is probably the right reading. And the easier reading is probably the wrong one for this reason. Think about it. Let's suppose, which was the harder change? To go from the original, let's say, that, um, uh, that uh, Elijah saw what happened and somebody changed it to he was afraid, or for having an original that says Elijah was afraid and to change it to Elijah saw what was happening. It really makes sense to think this, to say that the harder change is to go from uh, Elijah was afraid to Elijah ran. Who would do that? It, Jezebel is chasing him. It would seem to make sense. Oh, he's afraid. Yeah, we should change it. Somebody made a mistake here. But it's hard for to see why anyone would change a text from Elijah was afraid to an Elijah saw. And so that's the second reason. And if that one doesn't sit with you because you couldn't follow it, which if you can't follow it, it's my fault, not yours. There's a third reason, it seems to me, to say that Elijah ran because he saw where things were going and not out of fear. And that is that Elijah prayed to die. He was not afraid to die. He wanted to die. He did not want to die at the hands of Jezebel so all the Baal worshipers could cheer and Baal could be seen to have a victory. So in summary, Elijah, was he exhausted? Oh yeah. Was he discouraged? You bet. Was he depressed? Sure enough. But it wasn't from fear of Jezebel. And it wasn't from, as so many people have said, selfishness, abandoning all of his fellow Israelites. Rather, it was from a discouragement that anyone who has been a Christian for any length of time, particularly in the Christian ministry, ought to be able to relate to and say, oh yeah, I get that. So we look then at what about Elijah uh, makes us think that we should see him in a good light. Now, we should see Elijah in a good light because of what the text shows, not just about what's going on in Elijah's heart, but what's going on in God's heart. And that is clear from now, chapter 19, verses five through the first part of nine. All at once, an angel touched him and said, All at once, an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by the food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. This passage that Rick just read takes place under the broom tree in the desert where Elijah has collapsed. Now the New International says that all at once an angel touched him literally and other passages, all their versions do much better. And look, behold, what a wonder as it is, an angel touched him. It reminds me of a song if you've ever heard it sung alone, but not alone. That's what was happening here to this man. The angel touches him. Isn't that significant? Of course, to awaken him, to shake him, he's in a deep sleep. But isn't it also the feel of a hand on your shoulder caring for you? There's something that is healing to the human soul about that, and God sends an angel to do it. The angel speaks to him. Does the angel speak to rebuke him of his selfishness, out of his paranoia, and of his weak need, trembling cowardice? 
No, the angel speaks to him to say, here, sit up and have something to eat. It's part of what makes anyone who reads this just love this passage and what happens here. Elijah cannot even think clearly. He can't speak clearly. And he takes his nourishment and then, boom, he's down again and he's out again and he falls asleep. What are we to think about all this? The angel does this twice, by the way. Well, it seems to me that one of the great lessons of this passage is that God is tender toward his discouraged servants. Everybody who writes about it says this in one way or another. God is tender to our, our very bodies. The angel let him sleep twice. And this is probably not the most important thing in the entire passage to look at, but it is important, it seems to me. And that is sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is go to bed. Rather than read a little more Bible, rather than pray a little longer, rather than try to watch one more video of some guy lecturing about the Bible, listen to a tape or something to get some sleep because the Bible says that he gives his beloved sleep. So we have the angel showing God's love to our bodies, both with letting him sleep twice and also with giving him food. Now, I really never noticed this, but it was fascinating to have this pointed out to me. When it describes the food, it says, literally, and there was, um, let's, uh, let's see, we're down to verse, uh, uh, look around, verse Verse six, <laughs> he, uh, the angel says to him, um, uh, get up. And there was a cake of bread. The NIV says, it's just the word a cake. There was a cake and a jug of water. The exact same two words, cake and jar or jug are used two chapters ago in chapter 17 when Elijah is sent to the widow who is about to die. And then he asked her to feed him first. And he says that God will make sure that you're taken care of. And so she makes him a cake and the jug of oil that she has never runs dry. What the angel was doing is doing for Elijah, the very thing that God did for the widow through Elijah before. I don't know if Elijah got it right then, but I'll bet during those 40 days walking to Mount Horeb, he's thinking, oh my goodness, I didn't catch that. Yes, he did it twice. And the Bible says that the angel gave Elijah supernatural strength to journey for 40 days. He says, the journey is too far from you. Now, what's interesting is that Mount Horeb is not exactly known where it is, but on the map you'll see most people think it's down at the south of that peninsula, and if that is the case indeed, and there's a pretty good amount of evidence that it's at least near there, if not exactly there, we're talking about a trip of 200 miles. But 200 miles should not take a healthy man um, 40 days to travel. You see what he's doing? He's dragging, he's wandering, he's dazed, he's, he's shuffling, he, he gets there, God sustains his body, but the man is beaten and low, but the angel has met his body to a certain extent there underneath of that broom tree. So God is tender toward his discouraged servants in our bodies, but he's also tender toward us, his servants, when we're discouraged. He's tender toward our souls, our psyches, our, our mental frame, what's going on inside of us. As I say, we read twice that the angel touched him. We read that the angel encouraged him with words. Eat, the journey is too long for you. It, it, he's making clear uh, that he 
the angel knows exactly what Elijah's situation is. And isn't that part of what we need when we are so discouraged is to be known like that. He didn't solve the problem immediately. The problem is not going to be solved until the second half of the chapter when Elijah gets to Mount Horeb, which is another name for Mount Sinai, where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, and he sees Jehovah face to face. And there Jehovah re-steals his nerve and changes everything. But for now, he's given the strength to shuffle to the mountain of God. So I would say, too, one of the things that we're supposed to learn from this, not the most important thing, but one of the things, is that when we give help to people, it, it should not only be in a spiritual way. Some of you are very practical people and don't struggle it. But others of you or you, you, you have your head in a book a lot. You read the Bible a lot. You read books about the Bible. You may think about uh, things of this nature. You may lead a small group, teach a Sunday school class. You may um, uh, uh, often speak at different places or teach others about the Bible. And what may come to your mind right away is a Bible verse to give, some spiritual truth to say, something to quote. Indeed, we're supposed to do that. Many times we're told in the Bible to do that. But sometimes what people need is instead some sleep, a touch, a word, some practical help. Jesus healed people and fed people and touched people. He said, I have compassion for these people, as well as teaching them the deep truths of the Bible. So God is tender toward discouraged servants is one of the things we're supposed to learn from this. But the final thing I think that we're to learn, and I'm sure there are many other lessons I have missed from this passage, is this. God's tenderness toward us ultimately comes through his son, Jesus Christ. You say, well, how do we get that here? What are we just dragging the New Testament into the Old Testament in some artificial way? Oh, no, 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 no. The first time the angel awakens Elijah, he is called the angel. But the second time he awakens him, he is called and identified as the angel of the Lord. We have met the angel of the Lord numerous times in the Bible before we ever get to 1 Kings. Do you recall the story of Hagar, the slave girl? She was a servant girl of Abraham and Sarah, the great patriarch and his wife. And we read about them in Genesis 16, that Sarah is childless, even though God has promised them a child and a lot of descendants. And so Sarah, going by the laws and the customs of that day that would seem totally appropriate, said, take my slave girl, my servant girl, as your second wife, your concubine, your legal wife, but of a secondary status, and have a child with her, and that child will be considered my heir. So Hagar becomes pregnant. Now Sarah, who is so jealous that she can't have a baby, and Hagar does, mistreats Hagar to the extent that Hagar flees, and we read that she flees into the desert. Genesis 16, 7, then we read, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. The angel of the Lord, he said to her, where are you going? She said, I'm running from my mistress, Sarah, and told the whole story. And then the angel said, go back. You will have a son, and he will have innumerable descendants. And then Hagar said this, Genesis 16, 13, it says that Hagar gave this name to Jehovah who had spoken to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. The angel of the Lord, she recognized finally as Jehovah in some kind of visible form. He finds her in the desert and he comforts her in his sorrow. Now we come to Abraham. Abraham also had an encounter with the angel of the Lord, not just any old angel. When God told him to sacrifice Isaac on the mountain, the son of the promise that he had waited for decades for, we read that Abraham, in grief but in obedience, ties the boy to the altar, raises the knife. But in Genesis 22, as he's about to stab the boy, we read, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, don't lay a hand on the boy. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me, the angel of the Lord, your only son. God and the angel of the Lord are the same person. 
The angel added, through your offspring, all nations will be blessed because you have obeyed me. The angel is God. The angel finds Abraham in a time of great duress, and he comforts him with his promises. And just the last example we'll take, because we could take multiple ones, was Gideon. You remember the story of Gideon? He lived during the time and in the book of the Judges, where the Midianites, these desert folks with camels, had come and overrun Israel so much that every year harvest time, just when the harvest was about to take place, they took every scrap of food that there was, and they overran, and they took all the animals of the Israelites. We read in Judges 6, Now the angel of the Lord, not just any old angel, came and sat down under the oak in Ophir, where Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to hide it from the Midianites. He's a visible person who sits down. The angel says, the Lord is with you. Gideon, you're going to strike the Midianites. Gideon says, well, I, I want to bring an offering. Please wait till I return. And Jehovah answered and said, I will wait until you return. Think about this. He calls him an angel, but then he calls him Jehovah. Here as elsewhere, God's messenger takes the form of a man. This man is shown to be God. This man who is God comforts the person suffering under dejection and sorrow. We know, looking back, who that angel of the Lord was, because we know who it is that would eventually, for 33 years, seen by thousands of people, be the bridge between the invisible God and visible human being, Jesus Christ, the God-man. And so what we learn from this passage is this. Was Elijah weak? Yes. Was he thinking clearly? No. Was he worth very much right then? No. But God knew that the earthly sorrows of Elijah came because of the curse of sin on this world, because of our forefathers' sins and our sins, which splash onto us all the time. Ultimately, from human sin comes all the sorrow and suffering that we have. But God knew when he sent the angel of the Lord that one day this could be written of his son who took on human flesh, Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he took up our weaknesses and he carried our sorrows. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. This angel was Jesus Christ in the flesh before Bethlehem giving to this tired saint what he needed. He was able to do so because he had paid for Elijah's sins and because Elijah then was welcome as God's son. Whatever weakness you have here, and I imagine a few of you have dragged yourself to church today. I imagine there were those of you in this room who, when the prayers were being offered, could only listen and couldn't even make yourself mouth the words, amen, and pray along with Steve Boyer as he led. I imagine there are people in this room whose hearts are so broken that you found your voice crackling when you tried to sing the hymns and maybe weren't able. But God has said in this passage through his servant who is weak and useless, I love you, I care for you, I am with you. I have sent my very son to meet you in your need. And that is as true today as it was some 800 years before Jesus came in the life of this dear prophet. Could you bow your head and speak to your heavenly father about these matters? Or could you think of someone else that you love who needs to be spoken uh, about on their behalf to God your Father?
our Lord God and Jesus, our Savior. We thank you that you know our frame and remember that we are dust. We thank you that as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. We thank you that as high as the heaven is above the earth, so great is your love toward those who fear you. Thank you, God, for being that kind of God. Would you please express that love to the people in this room today who most need it, who feel the furthest from you and the most useless? We pray that you would bolster our faith that you are real when you do not seem it, to bolster our faith that you love us when we do not feel it. We ask you that you would do this, not just for our good, but for the sake of your great name. Amen. Just like to say before we go that uh, perhaps there are a number of you here, particularly if you are fairly recent to this church, who have never been to one of our baptism services or our services where some who may have been baptized as infants give a public profession of faith. This is going to happen today at 4 o'clock and it will be followed by a picnic. Whether you've thought about coming or not, just come. There will be food here for you. Bring people of whatever age. I think you'll be glad you did. And you'll see an aspect of this church's life that you simply cannot get just by being here on a Sunday morning. Would you stand for the benediction, please? May the grace and the tender mercy of our God, who gives food to your body, may he give food to your soul, and may he cause you to love him more and more. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen.